Okay, the first thing I think I have to do is set something straight. Um, but the people who know about the For Dummies uh, book series that it's actually not intended for dummies. So don't feel offended. And the official subtitle of these books are, is reference for the rest of us. And that's how that's the audience I try to intend uh, to find. Um, uh, during OTM work, there's always this debate about data management and somebody has to do it and then complaining and this and that. And all the others who uh, hear them complaining um, to explain why uh, it is a topic and, and what to do to avoid problems from happening with, with data management. So that's what I'm, I'm, I, I want to address in this uh, presentation. Um, there are similar, there are similar uh, integration is, is similar to that. Um, I still hear a lot of people talking about integration. It's just two systems sending information to each other. What's the problem with that? That should be easy. And, and we all know working on OTM, uh, if you don't take care of that, then your problem will, your, your project will fail altogether. Um, it's, it's crucial. And somehow data management in its way is similar to that. Good. So that doesn't work. I have to press this button to move to the next page. So uh, first, a tiny little introduction about uh, my myself, uh, in addition to what um, uh, Pam told, um, um, is about enterprise services, HP. Well, people thought HPs, printers, etc. Uh, but there is actually a division in HP that's 27% of entire HP, that's enterprise services which is basically the consulting branch. And as you can see, there's a part BPO, application service and infrastructure, and somewhere down the, the, the bottom of the, the middle pillar, there is uh, this enterprise ad application services. And that's where I would fit in. Good, so this is the question for you to ask, why is OTM data management relevant for me? I don't manage the data, I'm using the data. And that's what I'm looking at. You are using data, you, uh, uh, you may be working on client management, on supplier management, and they have to be incorporated in the system. And there are many ways to do it, and um, you have to take care of it. So um, there are a couple of points for this importance that I, I want to address. And the first is everybody's impacted by the OTM data design. And that's, uh, you may have seen in the abstract that I gave out in the, um, uh, for this presentation. The first, my clients uh, complained when they had to set up the rates. Well, Derek mentioned also rates earlier that it's a key topic they want to address. That is, OTM is like a Ferrari, very quick. However, you have to fill the tank with a dripper. So it can do magic. However, it takes so much time to work on that. And that is, of course, something that you have to, uh, to, uh, to understand. And uh, only if you understand that you find ways to improve that. Um, one thing that's impacted by the data design is um, you would like, like in your, your, your Outlook address book, you find a person by the name, uh, his last name, first name, it's easy. However, with systems integration, usually when in an ERP, a customer set up, they get a number. If you're lucky, it's only five digits. If you're not lucky, they are 10 digits. And that is the identifier. And in a bad type of data management, that number is the unique code that's put in OTM. And all of a sudden, that very long number is the customer that you work on day-to-day -day basis. So you don't understand it. Systems understand it. Integration-wide, it's perfect. It's always unique. However, you as a user have to use OTM. And you also have to appreciate the, 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 the famous GID, the global identifier, the unique key that's used in OTM. Um, uh, it's, it's tricked. It's the, not, it's the idea that always pops up everywhere. However, it's always also the database key, um, which is very technical. You can't just change that. It has all kinds of, 
of it should be unique, uh, no lowercase characters, etc. So um, there's a lot of restrictions on how the design of OTM is. It's not necessarily bad, but you have to consider it. Right, the um, <coughs> next topic I said is good design means less maintenance and costs. Um, it's, well, as you can imagine, it speaks for itself. And the reason is, for example, um, um, once you have a, a well thought through uh, design um, where you have strict rules on how you set up rates and, and how you can expand to it, um, you have no surprise later on. If you say, okay, I start with this carrier, I call him carrier X, and I start working with OTM, that's fine. And all of a sudden, okay, we're not working with only one, we're going to work with a dozen. So uh, what will be the new names? Um, well, you can't just call them carrier X, 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 et cetera. You have to find something else. So you have to do that in advance. It's obvious, um, but very often, um, what I found out during projects is, okay, we're looking at a, 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 a first scope of a project and, and this is what you need to do, make it work, set it up. And we always have to go to the next question. Okay, do you have plans for expansion? Do you have plans to go to another country? Do you have plans to work with different kind of carriers? So these are the things you have to, to, to think of in advance. Third point is the performance. Um, Somehow that's, um, um, if you look at web applications, um, uh, performance is never considered to be an issue. The performance is always the response on the screen. I want to type in something, I want a quick response. However, the performance in, in, in OTM is much more. The, the key element is um, integration when 10,000 orders are, are sent in at four o'clock in the morning. That's not processed in one second. And we all know that it takes more time. And usually when the orders are in, you want to do something with them, you want to plan them, etc. cetera. So it's time, it's time critical. And if you set up your data in such a way that from your order system, you don't only load the crucial data that you need for transportation, but also all the item contents, colors, uh, third level backup phone numbers for your contacts, you load a lot of data that needs to be processed and you don't need it later on. So you best not put it in OTM anyway. And the third is um, about the, the type of data. Typically we make a difference between the static data and dynamic data. <coughs> static being locations that don't change that much and dynamic data, the orders and the shipments. Um, However, OTM is set up in a way eh, there can be a blend of the two. Uh, you can set up your integration in a way that locations are generated automatically when you load an order. If you know OTM, you, you, you've seen this in the past. Um, however, uh, that may not help you completely. Uh, a good example is always we have vendors, we need to have a name, uh, 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 an address um, that you can take from your ERP system. But your ERP usually doesn't have all the uh, loading constraints or the opening hours. These are typically only set up in OTM. You can think of, I uh, load my supplier data with the orders, um, but you still need to maintain those additional pieces of ranger information that are relevant for OTM. So, um, the steps of uh, processing master data, I, I, um, I, I have a three-way uh, process or phasing. I forgot the expression I thought of yesterday, very late. Um, this is the user master data, meaning this is the one that you as a user can comprehend. That's how you manage your data. And even though it's very small there, but this is this looks like a, a, a rate sheet um, um, with carrier, where just it could also be set up in, 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 uh, in Word, for example, where just the basic rules of the rates are set up. And as you can imagine, if you try to load this in OTM, it won't work. 
So the first step you, you have to, to make is to make the link to the OTM business object. And the difference already see, you may call them products and, and an OTM, they're called items, uh, carriers or service providers. So these are the obvious uh, links between the two. However, uh, you have clients and suppliers. Why are they both um, locations in OTM? Um, then all of a sudden they are in, in the same object. So you have to make some kind of a distinction between the two. But you have to think, would you want to make a distinction because some suppliers can be clients? So this, this initially I, was, I, I heard when learning about OTM, we had this business object. What is a business object? And, and originally they were logical objects, um, but they've grown and grown and grown and they have hundreds of fields and, and, and sometimes, well, I have this type of information about a client. How could I put this in OTM? Woo. 10 consultants, 10 different answers. That could happen. I'll, I'll come back to that mapping of data later. But this is the first, first step you have to make um, to, uh, to make this step. And usually it's, 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 it's an obvious step, that, uh, to be honest. But it's really the, the type of exceptions um, that may not have an obvious choice on how to make that, uh, that change. And a final, that's our our, our CSV or, or data tables, that's how it's all set in, in the database. I, I did a little check on the, the number of tables that Oracle actually uses for OTM. I remember a long, long time ago, I, I checked, uh, there were like seven or 800, and <laughs> all of a sudden there are 1600 already. So that may have happened over the f past five, six years. And, um, and, and also, for people who don't know these data tables, a business object consists of multiple tables. Uh, the, the way that locations are set up, there uh, I'll, I'll have a nice slide about it later on. So, at, at the end, and that is the the solution for fixed or for static data loading is through CSV. And with the CSV, you are actually loading those tables yourself. So all the translation from your master data that you can comprehend to the CSVs, uh, you have to do. There are best practices, there are accelerators, there are templates, um, but you always have to say, ask, yourself, say the, ask yourself the same question that I mentioned in, in, uh, before. If this customer um, with this template uploaded this information, like um, um, secondary street name or, or customer client contact. Do you need it for your project? Do you need it for now? Do you need it in the future? If it's really redundant, then leave it out. OTM screens are supposed to be empty. There are hundreds of fields and they're always empty. That's why newbies always find a problem. Okay, we have the screen there, there's nothing. Oh, there's that field and that field. Okay, so that is, it, it's so supposed to be light. It's a transactional system, so don't overburden it. So this is the, the basics on, on, on how that transfer will, will, will take place. And the next, next step I'll, I'll go into is, is the pain points. So why is it considered to be so difficult? Why there's always so much work? Why do we always need these templates? And, and, and the next level will be, now there are always consulting templates. Can't Oracle do something about them? Well, the rate maintenance is something they're working on. And in the meantime, I guess that they are driven by that. Uh, some consulting companies have developed tools to ease this or to make it easier to work with rate maintenance. So first is the mapping. I already mentioned that. So what is the mapping? There goes my memory. I haven't mapped something right. Good. Um, there's it. So I took an Outlook example. We have a vendor and somewhere in Brussels. So basic information. So something wrong there with the question marks, but never mind. So we, we have um, 
so the question is how to put this in OTM. We're not going even for the second level. First level, how do we get this in OTM? Which field to use? And and here I already found some 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 issues. Well, I could put in location ID. That's the the general ID. It could be vendor. Um, uh, that means that that is always your key. However, if, if, if for whatever reason um, uh, there is another company with the same name, perhaps in a different country, you only have one field and that location ID should be unique per domain. I don't want to go into domain management. That's another topic perhaps for next year. Um, that should be a unique key because it's the database key. And that's actually where OTM is different from, from, from other systems where you can specify your, your name of an object. In the background, it will, it will generate a unique uh, running number that's always unique. And of course, that's happening in, 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 in Outlook or wherever. If you create an object, somewhere in the background, there's a unique ID and that's stored like that. So in Outlook, you can, I can change the name vendor to something different. But once you create an OTM, you cannot change that object anymore. You have to delete it and reload it. Okay, people can change it in backdoor and update everything. But that's something you have to, to consider. It's really, once you've done it, no way back. Third one, corporation ID. Uh, why do we need this? I have people say it's, it's there because it's it's in EBS you also have the possibility to group objects together to major clients who had uh, head office etc it can be used for reporting purposes but nobody needs it in OTM it's a required field you have to put in something there so most of my project we just put in a dummy name or a dummy or, or, or the company name so we don't need it but in OTM it's a required field so or choice. They can't go back anymore. Then we have domain name. Um, I'll just skip it now. As I said, another presentation, another day. Um, the address. So you see in the meantime, there are a lot of fields that will leave empty, but that's usually a good sign. So the address line, and as you can see, there are two things I want to highlight. The fact that now all of a sudden it's uppercase, um, and there's a the little accent grave on the E for Rue Archimed. Um, first of all, pe perhaps you know it, if you load by CSV, you can load uppercase. It runs into OTM, it's fine. However, if you go into the field and save it, it makes it uppercase. So um, you shouldn't use it, even though there are some exceptions where you can use lowercase, like the time zone, for example. But the uppercase, lowercase should be uh, should be clear on that. It accepts the the uh, the accent graph on the E, um, and this is where something else comes along uh, is the so-called encoding. Um, um, what basically is the encoding? Some years ago, when 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 they wanted to to uh, digitize text. Um, they had to give it a number between 1 and 256. And I think they with the A, they started with 33, and it goes up like that. And they agreed on the standard everything between 129, uh, 128. Everybody knew that I think 32 or 33 was an uppercase A. That's it. Then came the French and the Russian, etc. They had odd characters. Okay, let's use the range above 128. Well, in the Russian, 133 can be a certain character and in the French, a different one. That's why people have seen it. If you order something at Amazon and you put an accent on your name, usually when you get it back, it's wrong because it's pr transferred from one system to another, to another, another, and somebody has forgot to do the right encoding. So it's a pain. If you only use OTM, by all means, use accent. If you are going to exchange information, then you need to have somebody dedicated who will follow all the encoding. The easiest is don't use them. That's, that's, uh, that's one thing. Next one, city of Bruxelles on the left, Brussels on the right. Um, they're both right. You can even say Brussels in uh, Brussels in Dutch without the S, which is the right one. 
Okay. You would initially say go to your ERP, what they've put in. That's fine. However, if you're going to use this same data for routing, then you send this to PC Mylar, Mapping Guide, whatever. They may not understand Brussels. They may only stand Bruxelles or the other way around. Usually they're flexible, but this is something to consider and you have to make that choice. Uh, poster code, country code is also fine. Considering country code, OTM wants to have a three digit country code it uses, even though you can change the two digits, not a story. It's different from the text Belgium. That means somewhere you have to make that change. I'm not going to tell you where, but it's something to consider. So even basic information, I'm not even going to further information, you have these considerations. And there's more. <laughs> so the next level. So finally, somebody figured out how the best way to put all the information in OTM. And all of a sudden now you see two screens here on top. It's very small, I understand. It's location on the bottom here. It's, it's a contact because they actually merge together somehow. Primary contacts, people know about this and have fought this issue. Next is where are my data tables? The 1600 odd that I mentioned in my previous slide. Um, and to be honest, when I took this one, I created it years and years ago, I think this location row profile, there's something changed in the past versions. Um, and so I put some question marks in here because um, how do I know which tables to use? Um, well, there is a table called location. It's obvious. It, it's, it, it's very likely to be the location object. However, um, the, uh, the, the, there's the reference number qualifier, the famous refnums. They are not in the location table, they're linked to the location table. Uh, this relational database that you can link a lot of information to it. Uh, location refnum is still obvious. Um, However, then there's the corporation. There's no link to a corporation. There is an intermediate table location corporation. So um, if you are brand new to OTM and you're trying to figure out the mapping between the objects and the tables, you will not succeed. You should be very lucky. Uh, so it's always going to history, uh, going to people who have done this in the past. Um, I'm not even sure if you raise an SR for this, that Oracle will help you. They will say perhaps it's consulting work. They don't do that. They go and give it for free. There's no manual explaining this. It's only, well, perhaps if you run through all the service releases and all the service release notes for the past versions and rollups, you may figure out which one is meant for what. But um, it's not a done deal. And this is only for a location. Uh, look at how this looks like for rates then you, you end up in a very, in a, even a bigger nightmare. So to, what else do I got here? No, that was it. Good. So this is the first. So now we have what we put in here. And, and the next one is the, uh, the formatting. So we know now we have our data in Outlook or whatever, or hopefully in a better system. Um, and you figured out how to put an OTM and you figured out what are my data tables. And with all the upper cases, accents, uh, Belgium to Bell, etc., all these things you have thought through. You've done it for once and now you hope, of course, if you have a bunch of vendors that you can push on a button and it will load them automatically. So that's now you have to make this preparation. And during this preparation, a lot of other things can go wrong. So on the left here, we have our famous rate sheet. And uh, in the middle, <coughs> in the middle here, that is a, um, some people will recognize it. This is typically how you create in Excel a, a, a spreadsheet uh, to, replicate, to, to replicate the tables which you want to load. Uh, uh, and that will eventually result on the right in a bunch of actual files that you can upload in OTM. So that's the, uh, the standard process. Um, 
but the first tab and even on these on the middle page you see there's a lot of tabs so for all the individual objects uh, there's individual tabs so one rate sheet with one view leads to a lot of tables and that you have to get into uh, to OTM however um, we're humans that means that we um, the naming convention comes into play here they what are the objects again how are we going to call them and also you have to create a lot of tables for only one rate and for every table you have to think about the naming convention again and that's also a process if you take the manual from OTM which there isn't there's only online help um, they will not tell you it's also based on experience and that means that several consultants can give you several uh, different um, uh, responses on how to set up a rate it doesn't mean that one is necessarily worse it could be that in the meantime there's a new functionality that will ease the setup of a rate that you don't need the old method anymore you have to do it uh, in, in an easier way so this this um, apart from the fact that it's a complex process that you cannot find in any textbook you have to go to to uh, to support or, or 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 consultants companies or consultants even they have, may have outdated information because of the fact that the database is always changing so just to highlight some of the the the, um, the things here also, well, this, the, 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 I mentioned about the accents to, you can use them, but you have to use them with care. Um, we are using, for whatever reason, always Windows. And, and this default encoding for, for um, um, OTM is so-called UTF-8, and that's different from Windows. So by default, if you load your tables from Windows in OTM, all these accents are corrupted. You can change that in loading data. You can select the windows, encoding, it works fine. But it's already a first glance on what can go wrong later on. Um, another thing, actually, Evo, you mentioned the famous decimal point and decimal comma, the same problem in Excel. Um, uh, <laughs> I, I, I remember on a, on a German project where they created the CSVs and they, they exported things to CSV and next thing they had to go to notepad and search replace semicolon with comma. That's a standard process. Well, what happens if you put a semicolon in a field? Then it could be in a remark field, then you've got a problem. Uh, so the option is do that or set your windows to um, uh, uh, international UK to uh, avoid it from happening and actually um, uh, Mark Hagen well I, I'm not even telling a lie he said you shouldn't use Excel he said you should call J edit which is basically a very complex Java based editor which has 40 million encoding methods in it however then text looks crap so it's just like editing your CSV file in Notepad, so uh, then you cannot prepare it properly. So there is no perfect way. So we use Excel, there's no way about it. However, you have to know the downsides of using Excel. And, um, and even people say eventually, uh, and that's of course the end, if, if you've done it once now. Am I out of time? Did we st forget to start it? It says zero here. I'm lost. Two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Just tell me or hit me. Um, good. So um, the what I'm going to say is, even though we're going through the pain points of of, of making all this transfer, eventually, once you've done it right, you may want to automate it uh, with a tool, a sophisticated tool, etc. But it will, and why I think it's important for, for us here to understand this, that there are a lot of individual steps that you may not need to know what UTF or, or 
ANSI or whatever it is, what it all means. But the only thing you need to understand, okay, we could potentially have encoding problems. So every time when you hear something, uh, encoding, you hear someone using accents, there should be a little alarm bell for you saying, okay, have we considered this? Have we made it simple enough? And then of course, let the, the real dummies or the, the not dummies, whatever, they understand the business, they should fix it and, and make sure it's not hidden, hidden under the carpet uh, because eventually it will, uh, it will pay back. So what else we have here, what can go wrong? Um, uh, we have the CSV, commas, and, um, and, the, um, and the accents. Um, and, and the other thing, of course, that you mentioned here for one rate, uh, we saw the location, I think it ended up with five or six tables, and for a rate, uh, give or take 15 tables, that can easily be, uh, be done. Um, and to even make it more complex, um, you could have, well, if you have only one carrier with one rate, you have to set up a lot of things, including the carrier and the, 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 the area, the regions where it, it uses, and then the individual costs. Um, you may want to decide, of course, if you have a new rate for the same carrier, to create a new carrier specifically for the other rate or you can reuse the same carrier, which of course makes sense. That means a second time if you load something, what have already loaded, can I reuse it? And of course, then the naming convention is important. Make sure we use the same name of the carrier the second time compared to the first time. And also what happens with rates is that usually there's a lot of concatenation going on. The rate is specifically for a carrier, for a certain zone, uh, for a certain service, it's LTL or TL, etc. It goes on and on and on. Um, there's a maximum of 50 characters in OTM. That's one thing. And secondly, every now and then you see it on screen. Uh, the rate inquiry, you may have seen it. You see your rate here. And that's also an important thing. The better you make your naming convention, the easier it is for bug fixing. Or bug, not, not bug fixing, uh, bug rate fixing. Because nobody has ever set up their rates and they work. You always make mistakes. Um, however, then you have to find out what you've done wrong, and that means you, 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 you have to be able to test something, see what the result is. Ah, it picked up the wrong rate because I can see it on the name. Again, if you go to your 10-digit number for the rate, good luck. Good, so um, the next thing I, 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 I want to is the rest. Okay, so we know all these issues and I already gave you some pointers on try to, uh, to mitigate this. Um, to, um, to think. First is no die data. Um, I took the simple example for the, the supplier. Um, do your thorough analysis of everything you have. How often all of us consultants here know it we come to a client and say, okay, uh, give us your master data, then we can set it up. Okay, scrolling through some files and papers, Excels. Here we go, good luck, good. He's scrolling through them. Ah, you're not shipping to Belgium? No, we do, now where's the rate? Oh, we don't have it. So it's somewhere, nobody knows about it. Then we test something, always is this rate the cheapest? Yes, that's officially true, but we no longer use this spreadsheet. Um, we always call this guy, he gives us a better rate. So we do a lot of data cleansing. I didn't even mention it here, but the data cleansing is usually a part of a project where you help the client a lot by, by giving them just a feedback, giving them just a mirror to tell them what's going on. And there's so, so much things here. Um, uh, especially when data comes out of an uh, e-business suite, which is not relevant for them. Sometimes in, in, in the ERP system, they managed all the opening hours for, the win for, 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 for loading and unloading, and special requirements like a tail lift or van, uh, these things. And um, however, it's just ended there and it's never used. It means that there can be crap data and because nobody's ever uh, been confronted with all the errors. Okay, for one vendor, it's easy to figure out. 
but if you then get a bunch of 500, you have to check all of them individually. What happens? You use that data, you make your planning. The planning is crap compared to what it did in the past. And then you have to figure out why did it happen? It's only because in the ERP system, the opening hour, there's an error. All of a sudden it's not eight to four, but somebody put uh, eight to four at midnight or eight to 12. It will have an impact, of course, on the planning result. And there we go. Tiny little things, big impact. So, um, and, but the, the, the problem is if you go to the team who actually provides the data, they created it. And it's very difficult for, for um, <clears throat> things that you created yourself to, to have this reflective view on, on things that you may have done wrong. So um, you need a second pair of eyes to do that. It, of course, the client could do it themselves and we could, you, can, you can give them recommendations, you can do it yourself. But um, if you've never gone through this process of using the data for a TMS like OTM with all the planning optimization based on opening hours, then it may be very difficult to figure out where things can go wrong. But in any of these projects with data loading, uh, the first session is give us the data and just browsing over it, etc. Okay, that's missing, that's missing, that's missing. The, the usual things that can, work, can, can go wrong. It saves a lot of time. It's a good preparation, it's a good design. Well, that's where we're here. Um, if you're, as a client, go through things, ask a peer. Um, the advantage is they've le also learned the hard way and, 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 and they may be able to give you better feedback than just an external consultant that comes in. Um, also because of the fact that um, the, uh, well, it may not be a very nice expression, but the, 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 re the, the consultant is not there to help you, but to earn a living. And that's different if you talk through your peers. So uh, use this. And it's also a message in general for this sake. Use what you have achieved here and, and, and don't be afraid. We've all gone through the same. Uh, second is the uh, the standard functionality, and with standard functionality, I mean um, CSVs and, and 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 XML for 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 uh, dynamic data. Um, uh, DBX, yep. Okay, so the question was that you uh, loading orders by XML took a long time, and in, uh, as an alternative, you put in CSVs, so went much quicker. And then Oracle said um, the standard way is to do it by XML. Um, the um, why it, why it took so long may uh, well as as again I'm I'm not a specialist here. Um, the um, the the difference between as you know the difference between XML loading and, and, and CSV loading is that how OTM were treated. CSV loading is very basic. Uh, it's just um, making changes without telling the boss pretty much. And, and and XML is really going top down, tell everybody, okay, I'm coming in, please take care of me and make sure that I don't make any mistakes. So as a result, uh, if you load an XML, there's all kind of checks and it's almost impossible to end up with corrupted data if you load by XML, which is possible with CSV. You can, I guess, yeah. <laughs> um, the, 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 the disadvantage that, that, that I noticed with this uh, dynamic data to, to load them by CSV is that um, how OTM will process it because um, there are certain 
process it that start off when an order is loaded it will try to release it etc which may not start if you load them by csv and the reason i think why this is used is this mass upload of orders in that way is is uh, to load quicker and then just bounce the server it's a way for saying restarting the server then all this process will start automatically so it's a trick way of getting it done quicker um, but as far as I know, uh, which may have changed also, OGM does not support this to load orders by CSV, meaning that there could be one tiny little flaw that they don't want to fix and say, well, do it by, C uh, do it by XML. Okay. With CSV or with XML? Uh, yeah. But would you then also need to bounce a server after the CSV loads to make them all the orders process properly? Or perhaps run some other batch process? Very basic technical simulation. So um, that's why I was wondering if there is a way to make XML the only way to upload orders or can it if it works, it works. That's usually also what we learn with OTM. There are so many things that officially don't work, but people use it, try it, and all of a sudden it works, and we get a new method. And and um, it also changes with every service release. Uh, and the reason I, I, I mentioned uh, the, the other alternatives, there, there's also something you may have seen it going through the data management guide. There's the DBXML and the ASCSV. Um, um, uh, I think it, it just boils down to whether you want the data validated or not. Because if you're doing CSV, you're bypassing every control in the application. You're putting it straight into the database. If you're doing XML, you're going through all of the normal logic the application would apply. So there is a, a risk if you're trying to put all this in a production cycle that, no, that just there would be gaps yeah. in that data. Just Well, it's, 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 you don't actually bypass all. Uh, there, there are some processes that are checked, of course, when you load by, because the five minutes, five minutes plus zero, I got it. <laughs> um, um, there, are, there are some checks that are, 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 are actually done, but it's true, like uh, starting uh, workflow agents doesn't happen with, with, uh, with. Well, basically, if you do it by CSV, these objects you're on your own it may work but yeah that's uh and very of very often this is the way forward especially with these high volumes and you only have one night left to <laughs> make the customer prototype goody um next topic i had um yes yeah, so this uh there are some other file formats dbxml ascsv there are also people who well I forgot the new name, but it used to be Toad, and then all of a sudden Oracle came in. Toad is actually the lowest level of change you can do on a database. Um, uh, and and I, I, I've heard actually that some customers did that to update their rates. Uh, they found another tool to upload the data, and um, but it really, not even restarting the server would help. So it's, it's not supported, it's really dangerous. What you, what you can achieve by that. So even though it's not always a perfect solution, it's the, um, it's the, uh, it's the CSVs and the XMLs. Um, and also, for example, it's the so-called AS CSV, these application server CSVs. They are supposed to load CSV files, but then the application server will treat them as, well, kind of an XML that it will try to update it. But apparently, um, every time when there was a new addition to a database table with a new column, the ASCSV didn't support that. So it checked, okay, I expect these columns, and the database was updated, the ASCSV processing wasn't, so you couldn't update that column. So there are 
a lot of little things that uh, that uh, that didn't work. So forget I mentioned it. Or if you hear people talking about them and they hear issues, go back to CSV, go back to XML, stay to the core. Um, my internal clocks say two and a half minutes. I should be able to work with that. So work with the business process that knows OTM and your other system. Well, the encoding comes in here, integration. Um, uh, um, uh, what happened? Okay, we, we, uh, we have an ERP system that creates the orders. I want to load them in OTM. That's fine. We use the same order ID works. Oh, well, yes, we have also order other order systems. Hmm. Could they have conflicting order IDs? Yes. Okay. That means the naming convention should change that the name, you cannot pick them up from the old order system. You should do a prefix or whatever. Make sure your ID doesn't become too long. Before working on this, um, you should know OTM and all the problems, but also you have to know all the other systems that you're using right now and you want to use in the future. And I guess that's why Oracle wants to tell their, sell their entire suite at least, and it's a restricted amount of systems and, and, and there's experience available. But it's, it's something where you can, uh, uh, well, find nice surprises. And finally, and that's of course, when you've gone through this entire step, when you know exactly your data, etc., then you could talk to a partner or look for things on the market to accelerate this uh, or to build a tool or uh, listen to Neil Hatcher's presentation tomorrow where he will explain the data ma maintenance tool that Mayhawire uh, developed. It gives you a good flavor of what they're doing. You should know all of this because they also make assumptions. They have to make assumptions about the data setup. And, and, and what I noticed, I also told them about this. Um, some ways that the rates are set up is not efficient. From a automated perspective, it's easier. However, um, it requires more data. It requires uh, more workload for OTM to process the rates um, than if you would have an addition design. So um, there are always assumptions, there are always restrictions to that. And then he tells me, yeah, I'll make that change in one hour and then I'm done. Well, as a user, you know, well, you have to go back there, purchase order, hire an age, uh, hire, uh, they have to work for an hour or two and you have to pay for that or you go into support contract. So make sure you know, know your data, do everything in advance. Once you master this manually, then you're going, then you can go over the next step. Zero minutes left, isn't it? Thank you. 